Thanks, Bina. Our second reading, good morning. <laughs> Our second reading is from Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, and then verses 13 to 25. The words are there on the screen. You can follow along, or you'll find them on page 190 in the New Testament on the Pew Bibles. So this is Paul writing, and he says, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. But through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say. Do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I'm warning you as I warned you before. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so we've just thrown a lot of scripture at you. A lot. And I'm going to throw some more at you. It's been customary in this church to use the common lectionary to guide the scripture passages and the themes for each week. The lectionary publishes, publishes recommended readings for each week from the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, from the New Testament, from the Psalms, and from the Gospel. So these passages we read today come from the guidance there in the common lectionary, as we did last week. And these, while a lot to take in, are powerful scripture. Especially this scripture from Paul in Galatians. Let's remember what we read last week. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came. But now that faith has come, we're no longer subject to the disciplinarian, that is the law. For in Christ we are all children of God through faith. It was last week's sin. This week, we, I just read, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery to the law. Last week, Paul writes, the law was our disciplinarian, but now that Christ has come, we're no longer slaves to that disciplinarian. We are in Christ. So the disciplinarian, the law, slavery to the law, burdened by the yoke of the law, was washed away by Christ. We're no longer subject to the law. We're saved through faith. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, and this is a well-known verse, By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God not the result of works, so that no man may boast. It's 
go over that again. By faith you have been saved. By grace. Grace being that unmerited, undeserving, limitless, infinite love of God. Which protects us and saves us from sin and its self-imprisonment and its limitations. Now, when we get to the topic of salvation, a lot of pastors are going to want to talk about hell. You want to talk about hell? Come see me. I'll talk about hell all you want. But this morning, I want to talk about God's grace. I want to talk about the love of Christ that provides to us the abundant life. As, John's, as, as John writes in John 10.10, 10, Lisa's favorite verse in the Bible, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly. That's the life that Christ wants for us. The abundant life. And the abundant life that John describes is equal to the fruit of the Spirit that Paul describes in his letter to the Galatians. A life full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Sounds idyllic, doesn't it? But it's so counter-cultural and so contrary to that Protestant work ethic that perhaps we grew up with. This notion that it's our duty to achieve success through hard work and through our thriftiness. That we're to keep our nose to the grindstone and that our success is seen that God blesses us. That we are blessed by God. It's similar to today's popular prosperity gospel that calls on us to pray for our material success to pray for our financial reward. And if it doesn't come, then you're just not praying hard enough and you need to keep trying. That your faith isn't strong enough. Let me say unequivocally right here and right now, no. That is not what we believe. Our gifts, our, aff our affluence, our advantages, whatever they may be, are to be met with gratitude as gifts from the Lord. And our actions should flow from that gratitude. Now, do I believe in hard work? Oh, oh yeah, very much so. But not as a means of earning God's favor, not as a means of scoring points with the Lord, but as an outpouring of our gratitude for the many blessings God has provided us. This notion of working to earn God's love, that is not Christ's model at all. Christ's model, again, is grace and love. Paul writes in Romans chapter 11, but if it, it being salvation, but if it is by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would not be grace. Matt Chandler is a popular pastor in Dallas, he talks about the grace of God often. And he's quick to say, it's about grace. It's not grace plus. It's not grace plus you have to go to church every Sunday without fail. It's not grace plus you have to be baptized in a very specific, certain manner. It's not grace plus you have to give penance by some very specific form of penance. It's grace. It's about the unmerited, infinite love of God, us receiving that free gift, and us committing our life to love. Now, there's a subtle complexity here. Here's the advanced course, but you guys are ready for it, I can see. James chapter 2, starting at about verse 14, says this. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? 
Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, but does nothing to help their physical needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, it's dead. I saw a video a couple of years ago, and I was talking to Bruce Henry about this this week, and the video shows a, a guy, much like myself, preparing for a, a weekly Bible study. As he's preparing for the Bible study, the phone rings, and one of his regular Bible study participants says, I'm not going to make it night tonight. I'm, I'm stuck out on the road. I've got a flat tire. I've got a spare but no jack. I called AAA. It's going to be a couple of hours. I'm not going to make it tonight. To which the Bible study leader says, well, that's really too bad. We'll pray for you. No! Get in your car and go help your friend. Now, I believe in prayer. But we also have to act. James's point in this writing is that love without action is not true love. It's lip service. He isn't preaching deeds in order to earn God's favor. He's preaching deeds as a manifestation of our faith and love, our love for God and our love for our neighbors. Now, God gave us free will. As, he, as, Paul, as Paul writes in Galatians 5 that I just read, Free will to choose to live a life in the flesh or to choose to live a life in the spirit. When we choose that life in the flesh, in our selfishness, that free will can separate us from God. And we're not capable of escaping that cycle on our own. There are countless stories in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, there are countless stories of people who are in this cycle of selfishness and they can't break free. That's why Christ was sent. God, out of his love for all of us, provides that free gift of salvation through Christ. I keep saying free gift because this gift is both free and comes at a cost. It's free to us because the cost was, pay, was paid by Christ on the cross. Christ died on the cross for us to atone for our sins and to pay our debt in advance. So, I keep saying over and over that we're called to have faith. We're called to receive that grace. Are we expected to do so perfectly? Of course not. And there's a great story in Mark chapter 9 that I would encourage you to read later today or throughout the week. Mark chapter 9, starting at about verse 14, a man brings his son to Jesus to be healed. A man describes his son. He says he has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down and he foams and grinds his teeth, and he becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to cast out the demon, but they could not do so. Jesus says, bring your son to me. When the spirit saw Jesus, immediately it threw the boy into convulsions. He fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, how long has he been like this? The boy's father said, from childhood. It is often cast him into the fire or into the water to destroy him. But if you're able to do so, please have pity on us and help. Jesus says, if, if all things are possible for one who believes, to which the father said, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. 
this man takes his son to Jesus to be healed and then immediately admits to Jesus that he has faith and he has doubts. How much like all of us. But he has the, the humility, the honesty, the audacity to be that straightforward with Christ. Whereas we so often bluff. Amen? The story that Bina read about Naaman is similar. Naaman is a mighty soldier in the kingdom of, of Iran, but he has leprosy. So the king of Iran sends Naaman to the king of Israel, who he heard could heal him. But the king of Israel rejects Naaman immediately. Elisha, a great holy man, finds out about this and calls for Naaman to come to him. Naaman, through a messenger, says, excuse me, Elisha, through a messenger, says to Naaman, go to the Jordan River and immerse yourself seven times and you'll be healed. Naaman is furious. I thought he was going to heal me. I've bathed in other rivers before. Our rivers at home are just as good, if not better, than these. His servants, though, persuade him to do what Naaman instru what Elisha instructed him to do. And he does it, and he's healed. Like Naaman, we too have to listen to what God is saying to us with an open mind not filtered by what we want God to say to us, but with an unfiltered ear so that we can hear what God is telling us to do as we go forward. So we need to have faith. Perfect faith? No. Note that after the man tells Jesus he has faith but doubts, after Jesus hears that, Jesus heals the boy, the son of a man who admittedly has doubts. Jesus doesn't expect perfect faith. He just calls us to have faith. So, back to the fruit of the Spirit. Life according to the flesh. In other words, life where we rely on our own human capabilities and impulses leads to, as Paul describes, impurity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, and on and on and on. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do we say that we believe, snap our fingers, and immediately these things wash over us completely? Of course not. But without faith, that abundant love, that love described by the fruit of the Spirit, is simply not available to us. This is the gospel. I can't force you to believe it. My mom tried. We all must choose to believe. Let us choose to leave lives of faith. Let us seek God's grace and let us enjoy the fruit of the Spirit that only faith in Christ provides.